Well, welcome back to the third session. It's been wonderful to have this opportunity to share with you. And uh, I hope uh, that you'll take the time to review these three sessions as you move forward. Maybe right now you're not facing, for example, the decisions to make about a 401k, but when that time comes, I hope you'll go back and review uh, these three sessions. And I hope you'll become uh, a, a regular visitor at paulmerriman.com. But in this third session, I want to talk about some of the biggest risks that you take as an investor. There are over 25 legitimate risks that investors take. And I'm not going to cover 25 in the time that we have, but I will cover some that aren't so normal, aren't common, and yet are really very large in terms of your likely success. So let's talk about these risks. And let's start by making the point that you really, it's important that you identify them all. Uh, I think, for example, if you read my free book, it's at paulmerriman.com, 101 Investment Decisions Guaranteed to Change Your Financial Future. Every one of those have something to do with a risk. But I think it's important you not only know what the risks are, but you understand them. You, you, you try to get some historical perspective about those risks. In this particular session, I'll talk about bear markets. It's one thing to know there are bear markets and that you could lose 20% or more of your investment value due to a bear market, but it's something else to know the history of bear markets because that will be an important part of your future. Then your goal is to manage these risks because at the end of the day, successful investing is first about being willing to take the risk, for example, of equities over fixed income. That's a big step. But then how do you manage it? How do you make sure that you get all of the return that you should get? Because if you don't, then you've missed a risk. So I want you to not only identify them, understand them, but I want you to be able to manage them. That is key to your long-term success. And one of the things that people don't often think about as a risk of investing is they don't have a good source of information. They decide to count on Wall Street, for example, stockbrokers or, or people on CNBC or banks or insurance companies, people who generally have a conflict of interest. They are generally not doing they're not bad people. They're just in business to sell something in order to make a living. And most often what they're selling is not truly in your best interest. That's why, for example, I don't want you to own uh, actively managed funds because there are all sorts of expenses that go along with that. But that's the way Wall Street gets paid, all kinds of expenses going into their pocket instead of yours. The other source of information is Main Street. Main Street, a neighbor, a relative, somebody at the office that claims to understand the investment process. And they may even tell stories about great success. That's the good news. The bad news is they don't normally tell you the stories about where they failed. And nor do they take the time to figure out whether the things they've done are actually appropriate for you and your risk tolerance. And then the last of the major sources is University Street. That's what I trust, the academic community. They take the purest look at what is in your best interest that I know, and they are paid to look and look and look some more. And after they take a stand, they are peer reviewed. So others can critique their work. I will tell you, if somebody who just had a recommendation 
from Wall Street had a chance to go check it with the peers or with the academic community, it would rarely stand up to their review. I want you to be in things that have been peer reviewed in your best interest. That's academic community as far as I'm concerned. Now, another risk people don't think about often is what at the deepest emotional level is your investing about? Is your investing about wanting to beat the market? See, for a lot of young people, that's what it is. They want to find some way to hit a home run. They want to do better than the S&P 500 that's supposed to make 10% a year. Well, that sounds good. It sounds admirable. But remember, when the market is down and dirty, like for example, technology from 2000 through 2002, the index that tracked technology stocks fell 80%. So if you only went down 70%, way to go, you beat the market. Now, I don't, I'm not sure that's what you had in mind. I have found that most people who say they wanna beat the market, what they really want is to get the highest return they possibly can for the amount of loss they're willing to accept, their tolerance for risk. So how much is that? Well, most people don't have any idea until they face it. And then they know, oh, that's more than I wanted to lose. And then many people, after having lost a lot of money, because they hate taking a loss, there's an emotional response, they hate taking a loss, so they'll wait until it breaks even before they'll consider taking a loss. And at that point, most investors are anxious to get out, regardless of what happens next. I think that this getting the highest return within your risk tolerance means you have to understand what your risk tolerance is. The good news is that there are tables, we produce tables, others do as well, to give you an idea of what that risk might be. When you go to paulmerriman.com, you'll be able to look at the fine tuning your asset allocation tables. There are lots of them for aggressive strategies, for conservative strategies, but it will show you 50 years, year by year, what you had to put up with to be in any of those strategies. And, uh, and not only that, but we also show you in other tables, if you invested in any of those strategies from very conservative to very aggressive, how would you have done if you put $1,000 a year away over that 50 years? I think you'll learn a lot from that. But then there's another group they want to find the lowest risk way to achieve the return they need. They tend to be older people. They tend to be people who have tried and failed as an investor. And now they're figuring out, God, I know, can't do that again. And so they're trying to figure out how could I, at the lowest risk possible, get the 8% or the 6% or the 10% that I, that I need or I want. Which, by the way, this all means you've got to know about not only your inside emotionally about this process, but what are the physical aspects of your goal setting? What return do you need? Uh, by the way, uh, at, at, at paulmerriman.com on the home page, there's a link to a free chapter of my book, Financial Fitness Forever, that will give you 12 numbers you should all know. And if you don't know them, you should have somebody suggest them because they are the numbers that you're going to need for the rest of your life if you want to think about the rest of your life and your investments. I hope you have a chance to read that. The price is right. And another risk is you're not realistic. You have expectations that just are not likely to be fulfilled. And that means that maybe you take more risk than you should. Maybe you don't take enough risk, actually. That could be a, another problem with unrealistic expectations. 
when somebody thinks that that investing is the same thing as going to Las Vegas, I'm thinking, you know something? I don't I don't have any problem understanding why that person doesn't want to invest if that's what they believe. But their expectations are just way off base. On the other hand, I can guarantee, I can absolutely guarantee if you follow my advice and you follow the advice of any expert in this the investment process, they which should be able to guarantee you will lose money. I don't mean lose money forever. Yes, if you put all your money in Washington Mutual. Yes, if you put all your money in Enron or Eastern Airlines or any number of companies that no longer exist because they're bankrupt. Yes, you can lose it all. But when we talk about investing in diversified index funds, I know they go, to, they've always come back. They have always come back. And so my belief is if you're in the S&P 500, oh, from time to time, you're going to lose half of your money. I guarantee it. Now, it might not be half, it might be 60, it might be 40. But we have to know that's coming. And I can also guarantee from everything I know about the past that there will be long periods of underperformance, not meeting your expectations. Think of the people who from 1975 to 1999 compounded their money at over 17% a year. And they've been talking to their friends about it. How wonderful it is to be in the S&P 500. Well, what expectation would that person have? Well, of a very high return. As a matter of fact, in December of 2000, surveys were taken and investor, investors believed that for the next decade, they were going to make 20 to 30% a year. Why? Because the previous five years, the market had made over 28% a year. That created expectations that were totally inappropriate statistically. There was no time in history that we had had that before, and yet we had many decades of history to look at before that happened, but it did happen. It did happen. And so people invested thinking they were going to make a ton of money. Instead, for the next 10 years, the stock market actually loses money at a rate of about 1% a year. So underperformance is part of the process. One of the reasons we want you to diversify broadly amongst many different asset classes and many stocks is because the more diversification you have, the less likely are you to be disappointed. Oh, you will even with broad diversification, you'll have underperformance and sometimes for extended periods of time. And I do think that it really helps you become a better long-term investor if you know and are ready for the losses and you know and ready for a short-term feeling of disappointment. And then hopefully you gather yourself back together and your, mar your, and your money is still invested for the long-term at the right balance of fixed income and equity, depending on who you are. And then you stay the course because the winners, the winners that, that I know, every winner I know other than, than a lottery winner has done it over a very long period of time. A lot of professors who have taught at Western and the University of Washington and any academic uh, com, uh, university in the, in, in the country has probably put money in TIAA CREF, a family of funds. Some put it all into very conservative. And some people invested every month in the S&P 500, no matter what. And those people who did that ended up being multimillionaires. And they didn't have to make a million to end up being worth a million. Let me give you some perspective. Uh, Daryl Balls, who along with Chris Pedersen, the two of them make up the foundation research team, two 
unpaid, hardworking people who really are trying to help you do better. I want to look at every 10-year period, every decade, from 1930 through the end of 2019. And let me just show you, everything works out in the end. Everything ends up like we expect it to. And that is from 1930 to 2019, small cap value was the biggest winner, the big performer, 13.7%. Small cap blend, next, 12.2. Remember, small does better than large over the long term. And then the four fund combo, remember that was some of each of the four different equity, U.S. equity asset classes. The large blend, the small blend, the large value, the small value, 25% each. So the really good performance of the small asset classes are going to help. And down below the four fund combo, which compounded at 11.9, was large cap value. That's the, that's the one that we would expect to have slightly lower returns. And it did, 11.1. The S&P 500 from 1930 to 2019, 9.8. Let's keep in mind, higher risk and better returns, lower risk, lower returns, which means we would expect below the S&P 500 in returns, we should find the bonds. And yes, we do. Long-term government bonds compounded at 5.7 and T-bills at 3.3. So that's the range long-term. You have a child in the coming years and you put money away for them and they live to be 90. This is kind of what it should look like if the future looks like the past. Remembering, there is no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. There it is. It tells you what we should have done. But now let's go back and take the trip. Let's take the trip. The first 10 years was a rotten 10 years. And what we learned is in a really a bad 10 years, you can have a better return in bonds than you do in stocks. There's the long-term government bonds up 4.9% from 1930 to 39, while the S&P 500 is down one-tenth of 1% 1 a year. Okay? Now, I can tell you, you don't see it here, but up to that point, Stocks have been making lots of money, but boy, not in that 10 years. And as we all know, that was one of the worst 10 years in stock market history. It was not a catastrophic event. It's not like if you lived through the 10 years, you lost everything. You didn't if you were diversified. And you'll notice down here at the bottom, the value stocks, they perform their worst performance comes when the market is really down and dirty, okay? So I can tell you that after that 10 years, people were not very interested in being in the stock market. No, now it's a really bad place to be. Maybe somebody even remembers the handful of people who jumped out of uh, high rises, uh, uh, skyscrapers in New York when they lost all their money. Remember a lot of people when the crash came in 1929 were leveraged. They were putting down 10% and borrowing 90% and buying stock. That is a disaster just waiting to happen because if your stock goes down 10%, forget about 50%, you're wiped out. And a lot of people got wiped out. But diversified? No. You had to stick in there. You had not to cash out the money to live on if you were investing for the long term. And then came 1940 through 49. Small cap value was the best. 19.9%. Small cap blend for the 10 years, 14.9%. 
The four fund combo, 14.3. Large cap value, 12.7. The S&P 500, 9.2. And there are those two bonds right down there. Long-term government bond, 3.2. The T-bill, 0.4% a year for a decade. And every decade tells a story from in most cases, small cap value being up towards the top, small cap blend being up towards the top, not always. And then even the S&P 500, which is generally not expected to be at the top because it's the lowest risk of the equity asset classes, made 18.2% for that decade. The four fund combo made 17, so evidently everybody did pretty well, and they did. Large cap value made 16.9, small cap value 16.5, small cap blend 15.8. And the bonds were at the bottom of the list again, where they are supposed to be. But the next decade, small cap value comes back, small cap blend comes back. But remember, that really bad time that the S&P had back in the 1930 to 39 period, it happened again. It happened again in 2000 to 2009. While large cap value was making money, small cap blend was making money, small cap value was making money, the S&P was losing more money over that decade than it lost in the 1930 through 39. Totally unexpected. Lots of reasons why. If you thought that was going to be what the future looked like, you'd want out and you'd want out right now if you were in the S&P 500. But if you got out and a lot of people did, look what happened the next 10 years. By the way, again, the four fund combo, because everybody did pretty well from 2010 to 2019, but the S&P 500 did the best. Now, what I can almost guarantee you over the next 90 years is at some point or another, you're gonna be at the top with the S&P 500. Not often. But sometimes, small cap value will probably be at the top a lot of the decades. Notice one decade here, large cap value did well. Why did large cap value do well? It did well because value did well, not because the S&P 500 necessarily did well, but because value was the star performer. Large cap and small cap were number one and number two up there. So what I love about this table is you can track any individual asset class up and down each decade. And we're not talking one year at a time. At one year at a time, they, they, they'd be all over the place. And there are tables that do it one year at a time. One year doesn't mean much, as we know. Longer periods of time start to look a lot of like. In fact, before I move on to a longer period of time, I want to do something with all this color. And I want to boil it down to only two investments. You see, the four fund combo is in some ways less risky than the S&P 500. And yet we know over the whole period, it made about 2% more about 2% more per year. Remember, we're looking for a half a percent versus the S&P 500. But notice the S&P 500. Yeah, they got to be at the top, but they also were down here at the bottom a lot. And let me show you what it looks like when we go out 20 years. When we go out 20 years, all of a sudden, the four fund combo is right there in the middle. Every time, I mean, it's, it, 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 it becomes 
in third place because we expect small cap blend and small cap value to be up in first and second most 20 year periods. But remember I said that the risk of the S&P 500 is lower than the risk of small cap value, large cap value, small cap blend. But I want you to see over a 20 year period that the returns are not nearly as good. And you can have a 20 year period, remember I said from 2000 to 2019, made about 6%. So my belief, and the reason I, I so enjoy the opportunity to share with young people who've got time on their side, the greatest asset of all, when it comes to investments. Time for compounding. Remember how a dollar a day compounded for a newborn child for 65 years, $1.8 million? I think there's a huge story in this table. And hopefully, as you get to the point, if you're not there right now, you'll go back, come back and review this information. Warren Buffett says, his famous, famous quote is, rule number one is never lose money, and rule number two is never forget rule number one. Basically, it suggests you don't want to lose money when you're an investor. But remember, I said I guarantee you'll lose money. I guarantee it. So am I, am, do I have a debate here with Warren Buffett? No. He's talking about for the long term. He's not talking about for the short term, but bear markets are short term losses of money. To be a bear market, you got to lose 20% of the value of the market. There have been 26 of them since 1929, one every 3.5 years. The average loss is 35% approximately, and it takes about 10 months to get out of them. All right? Now that's, these bear markets, I want you to know, these bear markets ruin the long-term commitment time and time again. In the late, uh, the, the late part of 2008, in the first quarter of 2009, investors were cashing out and going the only place that made any sense to go, and that was to cash. Just get out and stay out. And many people said, never again. Well, then that was followed from March, March 8th of 2009 for 12 years. One of the biggest bull markets in stock market history. Let's talk about 1929 to 38. I hope this doesn't happen to you. I really do. But what I do know is there were nine bear markets and the average loss was 42 and a half percent. And the average length was 6.5 months. I mean, they were painful and they were fast. And here again are those, those losses. Actually the loss from 29 to uh, 38 was 0.9 percent. And from 2000 to 2009, 0.9 percent. Per year. It's likely to happen in your lifetime. Well, it has happened in your lifetime. You, you just weren't investing. The best period for bear markets, 1982 to 2001, one bear market that lasted for 3.4 months and it lost about 34%. You know, that left a lot of people thinking bear markets are just not going to be around like they used to be. And then just to bring you up to date, between 19, uh, 2000 and 2009, there were two losses of 50%, two bear markets, 50%. But bear markets have never been permanent. But I want you to see because when you're in that bear market, I want you to have hope of what it's going to be like when you get out of that bear market. Because when we look at the bottoms of bear markets going back to 1926, 
The average one-year return for the S&P 500 is 38.2. Three years is 18.6. These are compounded. Five years, 15.9. Small cap value, 70.7, 29.5, and 25. The returns after bear markets have been so juicy. And it is there that you will be so happy you continue to put money into your 401k to be there for that explosion to the upside. And here's the most recent two bear markets. October, it ended in 2002. And in April of 2009, that was the first month. And you can see for one year, 42, three years, 30, five years, 22 for small cap value, 24, 16, and 15 for large cap, and the same kinds, as a matter of fact, the, 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 the rocket that took off one year out of that the previous bear market for small cap value was huge, but remember, it had been hit hard. I'm not suggesting that this was 88.5% on top of having lost nothing previously. No, it lost something previously, but when they return, they tend to, tend to not always return with a lot of speed and power. But I wanna talk now about the biggest bear market of all. You know, if, 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 if a 20% decline is scary, think about inflation. Inflation reduces the buying power of your money. If the stock market goes down, it reduces the buying power of your money too. But bear markets are temporary. Inflation is forever. So from 1930 to 1969, inflation uh, was 2%. From 1970 through 2019, it was 3.9. That's hard on a dollar, I can tell you. And from 1930 to 2019, it was 3.1. Okay, here's what was left over after inflation in T-bills. Remember those guaranteed to make you something? Yeah, they made you something, but not for the not for the first 40 years, there was a negative 0.3% in your buying power from what you got in your T-bills, a plus 0.7 over 70 from 70 to 2019, and a plus 0.3 for the whole period. And why do stocks make sense in terms of inflation? Because over long periods of time, 1930 to 69, after inflation, 6.7. From 1970 to 2019, after inflation, 6.4. From 1930 to 2019, after inflation, inflation an annual return of 6.6. .6. And guess what the academics say that over time, going back even further, the expectation is about a 7% return after inflation. And it's been close. Look what happened to the growth of $100 with T-bills. From 30 to 69, you were down to $89 worth of money on $100 starting at the beginning of that 40-year period. From 70 to 2019, your hundred dollars grew forty-two dollars from nineteen thirty to two thousand nineteen. Your your hundred dollars grew thirty-one dollars. Profits thirty-one dollars. S and P five hundred thirteen thirty-eight twenty-two twenty-four. But I know this is the one you like best of all. Thirty-one thousand four eighty-eight. You actually made a profit of thirty-one thousand. $388 versus a profit of $31. And I think of those young people, some 23% of, of millennials who say, I'm never putting my money in the stock market. I'm going to have my money someplace that is safe. And you've got some big decisions to be making. I know that. You got to 
Decide whether to invest or pay off student loans. Well, I want you as best you can to balance the two. If you have low cost student loans, put off the payment as long as you can. When you can invest that money in your 401k. Ooh, and if your company has a match, hallelujah. And, 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 and the thing is, is we don't know. You want to talk about getting lucky? What if you start investing in the first five years you invest? Looks like 1995 through 1999 at 28% a year. That's the kind of luck that I'd like you to have. But you got to be investing to take advantage of it. I think we talked about that before. There are, there's a lot of good information on paying off loans. I think if you just just do a search for should I invest or pay off my loans, you know what? You're going to find people on both sides. But at a minimum, I want you to figure out everything you can to take, a care, take advantage of that company match. And then I'm going to show you in a few minutes the implications of adding more money each year to how much you save. And you're going to have to figure out how, how committed you're going to be uh, to saving. All the experts will say, you need to get to 15% a year as soon as you can. And how much risk to take for the long term and the short term. Short term, you shouldn't be taking any risk. What I do with my short term money is I keep it in the uh, Vanguard short term investment grade bond fund. And I use that to take out a monthly check to live on in retirement. Of course, the long-term risk, at a minimum, I hope you take a target date fund. The next would be a target date fund plus the two funds for life. And, you know, the third is I, I would probably put away equ all equities into a uh, four fund strategy. That's what I would do. And I'd probably keep it that way until I'm 40 years old. You have to make a decision. Probably won't even think about this, but some do. To retire for a traditional or to invest for a traditional retirement or join the FIRE movement. Financial independence, retire early. You want to go check out a website that's focused on that, helping young people retire when they're 35 or 40 or 50. Go check out Choose FI. Choose F for financial and I for independence. So here's where I, before I take you to the last little piece I've got to offer, it's, by the way, it's some of the best I have to offer. I want you just to think again of all those things I'm asking you to do. I got 13 things I'm asking you to do. Uh, the save, save early, take stocks over bonds, many stocks over one, low expenses over high, index over active management, low or no taxes over high taxes, add some small cap, add some value, dollar cost average, buy and hold, don't market time, Put your money, if you don't want to fool with it, in target date funds. And if you want to go the extra mile, try target date plus the two funds for life. Every one of these, I believe, is a million-dollar decision. And we started early on in these three sessions talking about the implications of making an extra half a percent. And what I showed you is that over a period of your lifetime with 40 years of working and, and, and 30 years of being in retirement, that, that or approximately 40 years, I guess a little more than that, uh, that you would end up with about $2.3 million more if you made eight and a half than eight and six and a half and six in the accumulation and then the distribution strategy. Big difference. Let's remember that 7.3 million and that 9.6 as we go to the next one here, table two. I'm going to make a change here. I'm going to increase each year. This is it. 
a 1% annual increase in your contribution. All right, you started with a, let's say you started with 5,000 and you increase it to $5,050 the next year. Little bit of an increase, okay? Which means over time, you're gonna be saving more. As a matter of fact, instead of 230,000, you're gonna save $290,229. And instead of 7.3, you're gonna have 8.2 million. And instead of nine something, you're gonna have 10 something million. And you added 2.5 million because you made the extra half a percent and you added the 1% a year, but what if you would commit yourself to 2% a year? How would that look? Well, that would look better as you might imagine. Now you're gonna be up to 9.3 million and 12.2 million for scenario one and scenario two. Picking up an extra 2.8 million because you picked up that extra half a percent. Oh, but you could be even more aggressive. You could add 3% a year. There are people that do that. Now you will have invested over the, what, 45 years here or so, you will have invested about $10,000 a year over time, starting with 5,000. And you'll have over 10 million based on the eight and six and over 13, almost 14 million based on the eight and a half and six and a half. There's that magic half percent. Go into town, changing your life and changing the lives of others. But now I wanna take another leap. I wanna show you what happens if I could show you a way to make another half a percent. If you could go from eight to nine and from six to seven. Do I think it's possible? That long list of all those things that I think you can do to help get you a better return? Yes. And now, this is what we would have. Instead of having nine million here, you would have about 12.7 million. And if you start adding more money, 1% a year, you end up with 14 million. And if you make 2% uh, a year additions to your portfolio, 2% a year. Instead of 5,000, the second year you put in 5,100. This is not gonna break your back. And by the way, the 5,000 is low for most of you. And finally, for the person who puts away 3% annual increase. So now you're going to have to put up $150 the second year additional. And if you did that, you'd have 17, almost $18 million. I know these numbers are, are not believable, but was the number of putting away a dollar a day for a newborn child for 65 years and ending up at the rate of return of the S&P 500 of, of 1.8 million, and had you gotten the rate of return of small cap value 12%, you would have ended up with about 4 million from a dollar a day. How believable is that to people? Oh, it can't be done, it seems impossible. No, it's just compounding. And that's an unknown, but at least it's a possibility. The bigger question is, will you do the saving? I do have a new book, a short book. I think I mentioned it before, coming out in a couple of months. I want you to hop over. I want you to, to, to sign up to be on our newsletter list. Oh, by the way, these, these are our free books right here on investing for first time and others. You can sign up for the newsletter right there. And when that book comes out, you'll have a few days to get a copy of the book free. I want to make sure you get it. Then I want you to take that book the way you're going to get it. It's going to be an ebook format that you can forward to your friends and your family. Okay? Now, I'd love it if you bought one of our books at Amazon. It's going to cost 10 or 12 bucks. All the profits go to the go to the, uh, uh, the foundation. Thank you. It's it truly been a pleasure. 
I love Western. I love coming back to Western. I love teaching at Western. Uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you do f have a fantastic career and a great family, and I hope some way we keep connected. Thank you very much.